Hi, welcome to the book of Esther. Esther is an interesting book because one thing you'll note as you're looking at it, maybe you're going to do your color code reading of it, is God's name never shows up. Yet he is 100% apparent through the whole book. Um, there was some controversy initially about Esther being uh, included in the Hebrew canon, but by 200 BC, she was generally thought to be fully accepted into the canon because of God moving in such a powerful way throughout the book of Esther. I'm going to give you a little bit of historical background for the book of Esther because it's quite a bit different than quite a few of the other Old Testament books. The book of Esther takes place sometime around 480 BC. Now what's been happening in the world since up to 480 BC? Well in 586 BC was when Jerusalem fell and all the, all the people that were left in Jerusalem and in Judah were taken into exile into Babylon. There were only a few stragglers that were left to keep the land going. Then in 539 BC, Cyrus, uh, king of Persia, conquered uh, Babylon. And he then allowed the people to go back to their lands, not just the Jews to go back to their land, but all of the different people groups to go back to their lands. Why did he do this? Well, in Isaiah, it says that Cyrus will send all the people back to their land, but Cyrus wasn't aware that Isaiah mentioned him by name at all. But it was very, a very strategic move. He realized if the people could go back and if they could worship their gods and if they could take care of their land, then all he had to do was collect the taxes. He didn't have to pay for the upkeep of all the people. They were happier, so they probably weren't going to revolt as much. And again, it was a steady stream of income. He was different than the Babylonians who believed in taking the people all into their land, but the people could still worship their various gods. Or the Assyrians who interbred the people with other people so they were no longer pure and ch challenged them not to worship their gods. So Cyrus was really quite a great politician. Now a little bit about the Medo-Persian Empire. It was as big or bigger than the Babylonian Empire. It conquered covered uh, from Greece all the way to the east coast of India, um, from north, northern Turkey all the way to Alexandria in Egypt. It was a large empire covering a lot of different peoples. Now why did this succeed? Why was this successful? Well, because the world was gradually moving towards having a universal language. It wasn't until 332 BC that Alexander the Great Hellenized the entire world. The Greeks conquered the Medo-Persians, but that's well after our story. But I always like to talk about Alexander because he's kind of cool. But he did, and, and after Alexander the Great, the then known world only spoke Greek. But at the time of the Medo-Persian Empire, they're moving towards that, towards having a universal uh, language for m doing merchandising, for sh uh, doing business, um, and that was then Persian. And the Persian Empire rose higher than the Med Median uh, Empire. And if you've done the book of Daniel, you'll understand the two horns and one growing bigger than the other. And I won't go into that because that's a whole lot of prophecy that I don't really understand very much of. But anyways, so what, what was the strength of the Persian Empire? The strength of the Persian Empire was that they had such a large army. They were called the immortals, not because they couldn't be killed, but because the minute one of the soldiers w was struck down, another immediately took his place. So there was never a gap in the military forces. And so the other foes coming against them were terrified because they believed that the Persian uh, military were immortal. And they fought like fiends. They were just crazy, amazing fighters. And so they won every battle. They won constantly. And they, were, they, would, they would annihilate all the enemy's uh, military, and they would bring all, their, all the uh, people that were defeated, they'd bring them in, the wives and the, the women and children, and then they would ha integrate them into their culture and allow them to still worship their gods and, and to live in their land, but they became very faithful and loyal to them. Now the writing of this book is around 480 B.C., it says that it's the third year of King Ahasuerus' reign. He's also known as Xerxes, X-E-R-X-E-S, Xerxes. So it's always fun because they have two names and it gets a little tricky. But he's known as Xerxes. So he began reigning in 483 BC. And 480 is, it, is where the book opens and it talks about that he had this big party. 
Now, why was he having a big party? Well, we're going to look at our timeline here. And in 480 BC, it mentions that the Greeks defeat Xerxes at Salamis. And then in 479, the Greeks defeat Xerxes at Thermopylae. You might say, who cares about that? Well, this is, again, an interesting thing. These are the Greeks. This is before Alexander the Great. So the Greeks were still a number of different city-states. And of these city-states, we know some of them. We know about the Spartans. Sparta was one of the city-states. Athens was one of the city-states. Uh, Macedonia was one of the city-states. And the Greek city-states, like the Spartans and the Macedonians in particular, were known for being ferocious fighters. The Spartans, in fact, they would, when their children were three years old, the, the boy, boys and girls, they would send them out into the wilderness with no clothes or anything, and they had to survive for six months on their own. And if they did not survive, then they figured they weren't worthy of being Spartans. So this was a pretty tough culture. And, but when, and when boys turned 10, that's when they went into battle full time. So at 10 years old, Spartan boys were already fighting. They were known to be so ferocious in their fighting that they refused to wear clothes because it hindered them from being good warriors. So they had their swords, they had huge swords, and they, and they were just absolutely ruthless in how they did it. So in the Great Battle of Thermopylae, if you've ever seen the movie 300, that's what it's supposed to be about, where the great Persian army of the immortals came against 300 Spartans. There were 300 Spartans, but there was also 1,500 Macedonians <laughs> in the same battle. But we'd like to talk about the 300 Spartans because it sounds much more impressive. But even within that, what happened was the Spartans and the Macedonians tripped the Persian military into going into a canyon. And then they, they blocked the end of the canyon, and then the Spartans and the Macedonians stood at the top of the canyon and shot down arrows upon the Persian army. There was no retreat, and they completely wiped out an entire army of the immortals. Roughly about one, what we call them battalions, was about 100,000. So there you have less than 2,000 defeating 100,000. So this is all kind of happening at about the same time of the writing of this book. But at this time, Ahasuerus has just celebrated a great victory. It's before the Battle of Thermopylae. So he's celebrating a great victory, and it's a wonderful time. And he's having a great time. And the Persians were a fairly immoral bunch. It was typical for them to have great harems full of women, beautiful women, and they would, they would bring them in and they'd do whatever they wanted with them. At, there's been some thoughts at the time of uh, the reign of Ahasuerus, who was also known as Xerxes, that he had upwards of 5,000 women in his harem. We don't know that for a fact, but anyways, he had a lot of girls at his disposal, and so it was this great, great party. Now, we might ask ourselves, well, how, was this moral? Was this right? Was this wrong? The Old Testament is interesting, and it doesn't really always tell us what's right or what's wrong. It's just what is what was. So that was what was going on. It was a great festival, and people were being honored and, and lifted up and encouraged, and there was food flowing like, like wild. Um, the Persian Empire, they, were, they, were, uh, they had access to the spice routes into India, and so they had all kinds of extravagant food and, and, and extravagant clothing, the silks and jewels and everything. It was a time of great extravagance. The Persian Empire was something they thought would last forever. And then, like I said, in 332, Alexander the Great, a young guy of 26, he conquered it walked right through, de defeated the Persian Empire in Susa, and it never rose again. But that's well before the time of our story. So we've got the Jews living in Susa at this time. Who are they? Well, these are the ones that had gone into exile. Remember, they were taken into exile by Babylon, and Babylon was conquered by the Medo-Persians, and where Babylon had been, the city of Babylon had been the capital of the Babylonian Empire, Susa then became the capital of the Persian Empire. And it was a bit further inland, um, but so these are the Jews that had been, that are probably second or third generation Jews from those that were taken into exile. God told them, when you go, plant your, plant your, flock, uh, plant your gardens and build your houses and raise your children and be part of the land. And so these are those that did it. Now there were a good portion of folks that went back to Jerusalem and back to Israel to rebuild the temple, and that's very, very good. But not all of them did. Some of them stayed and, and continued to do what they were supposed to do. And before we pass any judgment, we do need to remember that Daniel 
was in that land as well. He stayed. He didn't go back. Nehemiah went back and forth. Ezra came later. I mean, so we have this whole thing. They were all doing what God had told them to do, those that went back to the land and also those that stayed. So we have Jews in the land and quite a good number of Jews in the land. We also have then the Persians in the land and then any other peoples that they had conquered, Babylonians probably, Assyrians probably, people from all over living in Susa. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. So you have this whole thing and it's going on. And you have a hierarchy. The Jews were seen at the bottom of the pile because they were, they were people that were taken into captivity many years before. And then you have the Persians who were the elite. And we have our hero who is Mordecai. And we have our antagonist who is um, Haman. And you have the king who seems to be caught in the middle. Haman was a man who wanted, he wanted power, he wanted influence, he wanted respect. And you see that he does all these things to try to get respect. And there's one man that never gives him the respect he needs, and that's Mordecai. Because Mordecai is a follower of God. Again, even though God is never mentioned in here, you see that Mordecai and Esther live a completely different life from the one of the people around them. The Jewish people to this day hold Esther and Mordecai in great esteem because there's a time in the story where Haman is so frustrated and he's so angry about the Jews not accepting him for who he is in his leadership that he decides and he tricks the king into passing a law that all the Jews can be killed on a certain day. They are to be poor. Purim is what comes out of that. It means they are to be, they are to be uh, annihilated. They are to be destroyed. And when Esther hears about this, she asks all the Jewish people to pray and fast, and she intercedes for her people, and the king brings uh, deliverance for them. So it's a story of great intrigue. It's a story of great uh, murder and excitement and action and everything that you look for in a movie. One of the things that it's not about is love. It is not a story about love. It's not a story about, oh, the king just loved Esther so much and she just loved him so much and they were just hand in hand, all happy dappy. No, she was one of his wives. She was one of the queens. She was part of the harem. And when we go through the book in the next section, we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth.